Hi, everyone. My name is Evan Chan. I'm a senior data engineer at Urban Logic. And welcome to my presentation. So, Urban Logic, uh, we are an online platform that provides uh, insights. Uh, and we use Rust and machine learning, amongst other things, to um, give really great uh, insights for transportation, economic development, and other community use cases. So, why thin cloud apps? If we look at the progression of technology through um, the recent years, we can see that we have moved from, in the old days, we used virtual machines to uh, now we're using containers everywhere. And we can see uh, technologies on the horizon uh, that are coming on fast, such as serverless and web assembly. And what we notice in this trend is that cloud infrastructure is getting smaller, uh, thinner, and more concurrent, right? So uh, things that maybe didn't used to be quite as important, um, such as memory and allocations are becoming more important because when each unit is smaller, you need to be more efficient. And you know, we also live in a data-rich world, so we need to process more and more data. So that has to be more and more efficient. And finally, using less memory, it's more eco-friendly, right? So the, the question for everyone here, we're here to learn about Rust, is why use Rust for thin cloud apps? And uh, they are actually many reasons for which I personally came to Rust. I came to Rust from writing a distributed in-memory database called uh, FileDB, which was on the JVM. And um, I came for the no compromise aspect of Rust that it was sold to me that you could get performance, safety, and abstractions at the same time. Usually, you know, you have to choose, you know, one or two of these. And um, I found that it was uh, pretty much mostly true that you, you could have all three things. And also uh, with Rust, you get great control over memory usage, your allocations, and um, you have many ways to, you could even opt out of using the standard library. So there's many ways that you could use less memory. And that small profile makes it very appropriate for writing everything from apps to um, OSs, kernel level code, hypervisors, and so on, right? However, to take advantage of it, you have to learn how to control and measure the allocations. So let's dive right in. How Rust apps use memory. So let's start by re reviewing um, Rust memory model really quickly. On the left side, you see uh, what does Rust put on the stack? So they would be uh, primitives, uh, structs. So you have a couple of different fields, but, the, but everything in a struct is fixed size. You also have fixed size arrays and uh, pointers references two things on the heap. So you have some stuff to work with and then everything else that is dynamic is put on the heap, such as vex, which are lists and arrays, things like strings and other more complex objects, as well as some miscellaneous things uh, that we'll go over later. Now, one thing is that Rust does not have a garbage collector. So how does it manage memory? Now, this, this is a really important point for uh, folks, those of you coming from dynamic languages, this is the biggest differentiator about Rust. What Rust promises is that even though it does not have a garbage collector, it will track how your data is used through a concept known as a lifetime. So, so keep track of when your data is created, when it is borrowed and used, and it tries to prevent unsafe use and sharing of your data. And it tracks when your data is no longer used, so it knows when to free it, right? This talk is not gonna be about this, um, but, we, but this will be important to remember when we talk about allocating memory. So let's, with that, let's dive into some basic um, data structures that are used a lot and how much memory they actually represent. So we start off with strings and vex. So remember, vec is a list of a fixed type of item. 
So on the stack, they use on 64-bit architectures like the x86 and modern uh, ARM machines, they use 24 bytes. The pointer would be eight bytes. And then there is one field for capacity, which is how much, how many items this data structure can hold. Like that is how many characters for a string or how many items for a VEC. And then there's a length, which is how many items it actually has right now. So these are both global data structures. Now, then the pointer would point to an area in the heap that actually holds the, uh, the items or the characters. Now, um, the complement to VEX and strings are um, slice pointers and um, string slices. Both of these are immutable. They are the same uh, as the previous ones, except they are 16 bytes because you have one pointer and you have a length because these things cannot grow. So they just point at a location and they tell you how many items they represent. Now let's look at a more complex data structure, the hash map. So for a hash map, uh, this is a bit more complex. A hash map uh, can be implemented using buckets, right? So all of your items are hashed into a fixed number of buckets. Each bucket in turn can have one or more items in it when there is a collision. So what we notice here is that the list of buckets is basically a vec of a bucket. And in each slot, a bucket, you know, that uh, points to a bucket. And in each bucket entry would be your key and value pairs for the items. And if my hash map is a string key and a string index, that means that I'm storing as the key and value entry in each bucket slot, I, I'm using uh, 24 bytes for the key, uh, for the key string struct, and 24 bytes for the value string struct. So that added together, you know, gives you 48, right? And now assuming that the bucket, let's assume that each bucket has like one entry for the case where there are no collisions, then if you add in, you know, the pointer for the bucket, which is basically the bucket itself is like a vec, right? It's like a list. So that pointer actually takes up another 24 bytes, meaning the overhead is up to 72 bytes uh, per entry. Um, so one thing you need to be very, very aware of is that for more complex data structures, you have these nesting of pointers that can create uh, a non-trivial amount of metadata. Now, if, if your items like the, are, are large, then maybe it is not a problem. But if your items are small, then you might want to be careful and think about that. Now, where could you be allocating memory in your apps? So uh, we'll go over each of these items in detail later, but um, starting in no random order, um, one item that could take up a lot of memory is uh, serialization that creates a lot of temporary objects. Another one is when you use traits or trait objects. When you, um, we'll go over that in, uh, in a minute. And um, anytime you use clone and data structures and, and so forth. Now, um, you could look at your, at your app and go through and find out, look at these users, but maybe a better way is to benchmark, right? So there's two ways you could benchmark your apps. Right, so uh, one is to do dynamic memory analysis. This looks at, you know, starting from T0, the time when you start your app, uh, what is being allocated, um, how much, and it, it would track this over time. And it would figure out, hey, how, you know, what, what is the, uh, even if you allocate memory and free it, you know, where, where are we allocating and freeing memory the most? Where is, what's the memory churn? So that's a dynamic, uh, benchmarking. It, it, there's also static um, memory analysis, a static heap analysis. This you might be more familiar with if you come from a, a, a GC language like you know Java and so forth, where basically you could have an, an, an analyzer that walks your heap and figures out, hey, for a given point in time, 
uh, what memory is being used up? What is using up the most memory? Now, um, there are tools for doing dynamic analysis. Um, one is called HeapTrack, another one is called DHAT, and I'll go over examples from DHAT. Static heap analysis is a bit more difficult in Rust. We can get overall memory usage pretty easily uh, using something like Gemalloc control, uh, and we can actually diff memory usage. You can also profile data structures using something called deep size, but, but there isn't really anything um, comprehensive like you have with the JVM, but I'll, sh I'll show you some stuff you can use for that. So um, remember in Rust that usually the more things that you type, like box, that the more you allocate. So that's just a fun hint to remember. So let's now let's go over uh, some potentially some potential uses of memory and how we can uh, help uh, reduce it. So the first thing is look at your method signatures. What are we passing in? For example, do you see function signatures like this, where I pass in a vec of string? So this is quite common. You know, you want to process some string list, right? So at, at first appearance, you might like, okay, that, that's you know a nice signature, but there's two problems. When you ask the caller to pass in a vec of strings, you're basically forcing them to allocate twice, right? Once for the vec and once for each string. Instead, if we're able to uh, change the signature to uh, point at a string, string slices, which is the second signature there, where we have this, um, you know, ampersand in you know, string. This gives the caller two chances to avoid allocation. One is that they can point at existing strings instead of allocating a new string. That saves a whole bunch of memory. And the second one is that they can uh, pass in a string slice instead of uh, uh, a slice uh, of strings instead of a vec, right? And if you want even more flexibility, you can change the signature to pass in an iterator, which gives you the chance to, for them to pass in even non-list data structures is anything that can provide an iterator for even more flexibility. So that gives you flexibility and gives you a way to avoid allocations. So the, um, uh, the next thing is um, that uh, we can try to flatten our data structures like vec of string, vec, vec. And uh, I'm not going to go over all of these, um, but there's a bunch of crates that will help you there, such as uh, nested, that will save you a lot of storage if you're, if you're trying to have a whole bunch of a list of strings, for example. And there's a whole bunch of crates that can help you with um, strings that are basically inlineable, where when you have strings below a certain size, they will be on the heat uh, on the stack instead of the heap, as well as things like small, small vec. So there are, um, once we're doing smaller data structures. And I did a test using a, a repo that you can uh, feel free to visit, where I show that by using nested instead of vec, you can save, you know, like say 25%, um, you know, total uh, memory allocated. So, um, another area is by reducing clones. You might notice many of you are writing code using async. This is a really popular feature of Rust now. You can write code that um, you know forks off work, and you can do an await to wait wait for it, which is which is great. You might find yourself, however, having to clone a lot of data structures when you're calling your async functions and async closures because the data that uh, is passed into a sync because it's a future and could run on another thread, you know, it needs to be thread safe. One, uh, there's some quick tips. One is to consider using arc instead of clone. And uh, this is something that makes sense, especially for things like lists, things that where you could pass in a lot of items. Clone uh, will usually do a deep clone. What has to do deep clone is to clone every item. So that could be quite expensive. Using arc uh, just costs you uh, a an atomic, you know, a couple of atomic operations, and it saves you a lot of memory. Another idea is to use 
something like an actor pattern. This is where you try to keep your state local instead of passing your state around. And so you keep your data structures within each actor or equivalently within each thread, and you use channels to communicate and you pass um, you know, small messages and events only. So that's a pattern that can help and it has other benefits as well. Finally, we can consider using something like cow. Uh, for example, if you want to escape strings, such as you want to um, like for uh, URLs or something else, where a lot of times the string is not changed, but sometimes you need to create a new copy. Well, instead of creating a new copy every time, you can just copy only on write, right? Well, so how slow is ARC really, right? Um, like in case you're worried about using ARC instead of cloning, well, well, if the data is any same size, it's you know it, it is fast. It is you know almost always faster uh, actually. But basically, ARC is just an atomic increment on the clone and an atomic decrement on drop. And roughly on an x86, they estimate that this is between 30 and 120 nanoseconds, depending on which level of cache. It might be faster on other hardware. So um, now here's another area where um, you might be using memory is you might find that you have a signature like this where you're processing some item and you, know, you wanna pass in different implementations of traits, right? So you make your signature have this dyne keyword for dyne my trait, right? And now in order for you to pass that in function, usually you need to box it, which means you need to allocate some heap memory for that. Unfortunately, that means that every time you're calling this method, you're, uh, you're doing this allocation, which is you know, not the fastest thing, right? So especially in a hot loop, one trait, uh, one crate, sorry, that you can use that helps a lot is called enum dispatch, which is uh, really great. What it does is if all of your trait implementations are within your control, you can make it an enum. And all of your implementations of my behavior in this case are in this enum, my behavior enum. What we do is that we would annotate it with enum dispatch and enum dispatch will, will magically, it will, it will tie in with the trait and will actually make it so that your enum will implement uh, the trait methods if all of the uh, variants of the enums also implement it. So basically you can change the signature here to process my behavior enum, and you can still call my method on it, on all the variants that pass in. This, this is a tremendous performance boost and it reduces allocations too. So this is really, really great. I, I love it and I use it in uh, one crate of mine. So uh, another area where we could allocate a lot is R with serialization. Right, so let's look at a quick example, 30 JSON. We have to deserialize from raw JSON to an intermediate value type, uh, this um, 30 JSON value thing. This is quite common uh, for uh, serialization libraries. And then it has to do another step. It has to take this intermediate uh, IR and create a, you know, say struct or something, right? So. Um, one way that you could go with this uh, is uh, to uh, use, there are some faster crates such as JSON Rust, where the intermediate representations are more efficient. Like JSON Rust has a short value type where short strings are, are on the stack. So this makes it uh, faster and use less memory. You can also go to binary protocols uh, although many of them have the same problem, they need to translate to some intermediate layer or something, but, but some of them can translate directly to, you know, say a struct or something like that. However, I think the best strategy is just to avoid serialization altogether. No serialization. So what does this mean, Evan? This is what you would ask. What does this mean? What we mean is using something like flat buffers, you might've heard of it, Captain Proto, Apache arrow, it does take some work to actually create these formats. But what is usually meant is that there's no deserialization, meaning once I create a flat buffer, I can send it over the wire. When I get it, 
you know, I can actually examine the flat buffer directly from the network buffers and extract values out without creating another, into, you know, without translating it, deserializing it to my final form. So this is really fast. It, you know, usually you can do no copy or no deserialization. This is really, really good. And I highly recommend it. Um, so just an example from uh, processing JSON that, uh, uh, sorry, that um, in this case, uh, using my laptop, and again, the comparison is available in this repo that I have. And I used uh, D hat for heap profiling. What we find is that uh, using um, JSON Rust, where it would reduce the maximum heap used. So D hat actually measures how much heap is used at the point where the max, uh, when the heap is um, the largest in your application runtime. Uh, and we can see that it is quite a bit faster too. It's like maybe 30 some percent, you know, one third faster uh, because it has to allocate less. Uh, and, and again, this is the technique of using deserialization where uh, it uh, uses a stack value, a short string, right? And if you used uh, no serialization, it would be much faster than that. Um, however, uh, for some reason, the total allocations, you know, it does not uh, go down. This is like basically all alloc free, alloc free, and so on. And just to show you, I think this is uh, good to show you what the D-hat output looks like. Um, it basically gives you the top nodes at a certain time, but you can look at what are the top allocators for all time. And it will tell you, it will give you a stack trace. Here we can see that the stack trace, you can usually trace it to 30 JSON when you know, basically creating JSON objects that is using up, that is, 90% of your allocations. And it will tell you things like, what is the average size of the allocations and the lifetimes that on average is 73 microseconds. So it gives you a lot of really useful uh, memory profiling information. Okay. And just really quickly, we'll talk about a few extra memory allocation topics. In Rust, you can switch the memory allocator. There are two popular alternatives to the standard allocator. One is JE malloc, which came from, uh, well, it originally came from um, uh, BSD, sorry, but it was popularized by Facebook and was created for reducing fragmentation and concurrency. It does have a bit of overhead in terms of memory used, but uh, it is faster than the standard allocator. Another one to check out is called malloc from Microsoft. It is designed to be a small secure replacement for malloc. And in practice, I do believe it is also faster. So uh, you can check that out. And I have a benchmark that shows that sometimes it is faster. Okay, finally, for certain use cases, you can use bump or arena allocators. And um, Usually, this is when, for special cases where, you know, let's let's say uh, you want to sandbox some memory for a part of your app, you know, for queries in a database or certain namespaces, that kind of thing, you can just take this allocate memory by bumping a pointer, and then you can free it all at once. So for these things, there is a crate called Bumpalo, which is which is really great, and that can help sometimes when you want to control memory use. Finally, you might be like, Evan, so uh, reducing heap allocation is great, but I want to actually make my binary smaller. You should check out the cargo bloat crate. This will analyze your Rust binaries and figure out where is your space being used. But there are tons of ways that you could actually reduce. You could get down to really, really small, like well below megabyte binaries. You can check out this. And by the way, um, the slides will be shared and you can actually click, you should be able to uh, click on them. Uh, there, there's a URL. So uh, there is a blog that gives many things for reducing the size of your binary, including stripping, 
reducing the debug things, optimizing for size instead of speed. And uh, if you really want to remove the standard library, that's a way you can get down to extremely small, like C-sized things, but be warned that that has a lot of trade-offs. And I'm not quite sure if they are uh, worth it, but it depends on the use case. <laughs> so um, thank you very much. You can feel free to reach out to me uh, on Instagram, uh, sorry, Twitter, Instagram, GitHub, et cetera.